Welcome to the Providence Church Podcast. Pastor Dwight continues our gratitude series and preps us for Thanksgiving with a message about walking with others who bring out the thankfulness within you. Thank you for listening. I was thinking in this week about, well, I've been out of the country a few times, a number of times for mission trips. Also, years ago when I was in college, uh, high school and college, went on a a mission trip to our south. We have, a, we have a ministry in the southwest of the United States in the, on the Navajo Reservation. We're a part of the Churches of God. We have a couple of churches that meet on the Navajo Reservation. One of those is called Hoan Nijoni, and it's out in, in like this country area. I mean, this is, it's on the res. I mean, it's in the back part of the reservation. You have to travel out to get there. Uh, there's a pastor there when we went oh, 30 years ago now, uh, there was a pastor named Dennis Gerard, and Dennis was a big, burly guy, loved the Lord, full of joy, loved people, and he was the pastor there at that church in, at Hoan, and so our group went out, and I remember one day he said, hey, we got to deliver some food, some bread, some supplies out to this back part. We're going to be driving a little while, and I need some, some people to go with me. So my dad was there, uh, my good friend Bob Redkay was there, I was there, so we all jumped in the tr- pickup truck. Bob and I sat in the back of the pickup truck. Dad and Dennis drove up front. We got out to this place. I mean, it was crazy. Like, you're, it's way out. You know, New Mexico, like rural New Mexico, like on the res. And so we're out there, and we pull up to this little ho one hut, little hut, tent hut thing. And a couple big dogs come, <laughs> like running out, barking, screaming, like yipping. And Dennis just gets out of the truck, calm as could be. My dad gets out the other side. I'm like, I'm going to get killed. If I get out of this pickup truck, Bob and I looked at each other. We're not leaving this back. We were sitting in the back of the pickup truck the whole way out. Like, that's where we were. We were 20, whatever years old. So we were like young kids. So we just rode the back of the pickup truck. And we're like, these dogs are going to maul us to death. I mean, my dad wasn't afraid of anything. Dennis wasn't afraid of much else. So the two of them were like, and so we, Bob said, we'll just pass the stuff to you. So we, we, we were the unloaders. We just kind of kind of threw stuff from the back of the truck down to them. And then they made sure it got into where it had to go. And uh, I still, that was 30 some years. I still remember it like it was yesterday. The, 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 my, the hairs on my arm, <laughs> those dogs are going to maul me, you know. Um, it, it's, well, you know, we love, love the dogs, right? You know, this morning, as we prepare for Thanksgiving, one of the things that we want to think about are the people that God has surrounded us with, the people who we are joined to in living out the gospel and pursuing the mission that God has entrusted to us. So when I think about mission trips, I think about the people that I went with. And whether it was to Belarus or to south of France or to Haiti or to the the reservation there in in New Mexico. People, people, people. Because we're going to to minister to people and we're doing it with people. And there's power in that. And there's thanksgiving in that. Uh, Skip Heidzik actually calls it the family business. I love that. I was listening to the message this week. Uh, The partnership that we have with God and with others what we would call getting out the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, he calls it the family business. I mean, Jesus, what did Jesus say when he saw the fishermen there on the shore? He says, you guys have been fishing. Hey, I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to give you a new business, a new mission, a new new thing to focus your lives around, a new commitment. And so uh, our product, if you will, Hightech talks about our product when we talk about the family, what is our, because every business has a product or a service, something that they're giving, something they're putting out, something they're distributing. And so he said, our product is what? It's the gospel. It's the good news about Jesus Christ. And it's only the gospel that creates life change. And it was the gospel that transformed Paul's life. So as Paul writes, we're going to read this morning. This is a man who met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and his life was radically revolutionized. And he went from being a man named Saul, a persecutor of Christians, hated them, jailing them, beating them, killing them, to now one of God's leading missionaries around the world and the advancing the gospel. And his name even changed to Paul. So if you have your Bible this morning, The first chapter of Philippians is where we're headed today as we consider more today about gratitude 
and our guide to being grateful. And so chapter one of Philippians, if you have it, you can find it. I know Pastor Chuck last Sunday was in the fourth chapter of Philippians. So we're heading back there this morning. And beginning, beginning in verse three, as Paul writes to his friends there in Philippi, he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He says in verse 7, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, whether I'm in prison or I'm out in the streets preaching the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. You know, this, this book, and many of you do know that the, the Philippians is the, it, what is known as a prison epistle. An epistle is a letter. So this is a letter that Paul wrote while he's actually chained uh, in a, under house arrest, if you will, in Rome. And so he's writing this as, as a, from prison. And the dominant theme, the dominant note of this book is joy. In fact, uh, if you read this letter, there are several dominant notes, joy being one of them. Love is another one. You know, I love how Paul, who's this, uh, I mean, Paul was bold. We know that about him. He was not afraid to confront. He was aggressive in his pursuit of the things of God. He was zealous and all. But, but here, I love how he writes. He says, I, what's in verse, uh, was it verse 8 there that I'm reading? He says, that God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. My heart is full. There's a love deep in his heart for these people. And so there's a, a sense of gratitude. There's a sense of joy, a sense of love. Here's the thing I want you to know this morning. Paul had a discipline in his life. Uh, some of you might call it a spiritual habit. When we talk about spiritual disciplines, they're actually spiritual habits. And he had a spiritual discipline. He regularly thanked God for people and things. That was part of Paul's commitment all the time, people and things. What am I thankful for? He, he did uh, the same thing. In fact, he says there in verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. And he did the same thing in many of his letters to the churches that he was writing to. So I think we have them for the screen this morning. Romans chapter, when he starts the book of Romans, he writes this. He said, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. I'm thankful for you, the believers in Rome, because I know what, you, what God is birthing in you is getting out. Other, other people around the world are noticing this great faith that God has given you. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. He says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. God is doing a work in your life. God is doing a work in Ephesus, and I am grateful. I'm thankful for you. And then Colossians 1.3, he says it again. He says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Again and again and again. Paul had a discipline in his life of thanksgiving. We're coming into a season of Thanksgiving this week. And for a lot, of, we, a lot of us, of course, we have a lot of things that we're grateful for. But a lot of times, life can obscure those things. You know, there's a lot of complexity to your life. And there's a lot of hurts and a lot of pain, a lot of struggle, a lot of battles. And so it's easy when we go season to season to season to kind of get into a place where we're not always disciplined about giving thanks. Well, we're not always focused on being grateful for what God has done in our life. I know that Heather and I are praying as we pray just every day together and the things that she has been battling through and the health challenges that still with the fluid retention and some things she's struggling with, some days are just really hard. And so we, we, we are disciplining ourselves to say, God, thank you for, and we go back and we rehearse the things that he has done to bring us from June to now. And it's building our faith and helping us to stay united because it's hard. And there's days that she doesn't feel really that good at all. 
some days she feels great. It, it, you know, it goes, this, this is how it goes, right? For a lot, of, a lot of you who are battling long-term things. So the discipline of thanksgiving helps because when life goes like this, then the thread of thanksgiving runs right through the middle of it. That's what I love about it. So whatever you're up or whether you're down, whether you're down or whether you're up, wherever you're at on that bell, that sweep, thanksgiving is, Shh, this is my commitment. This is my discipline. This is who I want to be thankful and grateful for. That's how Paul operated in his life. Mike Woodruff said this. He said, Paul cultivates thankfulness. He trains himself to see good and to thank God for it. He rehearses his blessings, which he does not believe he deserves. He does not start with a sense of entitlement. Rather, he starts with the idea that he is a broken person who deserves to be punished. But God has graciously given him life and support. God has forgiven him and allowed him to be part of an eternal plan. And so Paul was grateful in so many ways for what God had done in his life. And it spills out as he's pouring it out to these churches that he's writing to in the form of the bulk of the New Testament. Paul is genuinely thankful for what God has done in his life and for who God has given him. And so we're going to start there this morning on your outline today. First one, we are thankful for the people that God has placed in our lives. Verse 4 and 5, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. We've experienced something together. So when we start to think about the people that God has placed in our lives, I think it's twofold. First of all, I think it's people who have helped us to grow spiritually, right? So when you think about the people in your life, who has been there to help you grow in, in a way where you are pursuing Christ and, and, and you've got people behind you praying for you, encouraging you, helping you along that journey? That's a part of it. It might be some friends that you have. It might be a pastor. It might be a youth leader. It might be a Sunday school teacher. It might be a mentor. It might be someone in your family. It might be a grandparent. But people who you can identify in your life and say, they've really been a big, God has used them to spur me on in the things of Christ. I'm more in love with Jesus because this person poured, sowed that into my life. I was thinking about that again this week as well. And I may have mentioned this name before. There's a guy that in my life named Dick Yates who was a pastor when I was a seventh grade kid. I met him out in Finley, Ohio at a national youth conference thing. He was my, my, my room counselor, and he pastored a small church out in western Pennsylvania. His wife died in, you know, probably the mid, when I was in high school probably, maybe, maybe early college. His wife passed away from cancer. And uh, so I spent time with Dick. We would, we would go make some road trips and hang out, watch Final Four and eat donuts, jelly-filled donuts and, you know, and all that stuff. And um, eventually when I got to college, uh, Dick liked to golf. I liked to golf. And so we planned a couple of spring break trips. I didn't go to the beach and hang out. I went, I went to Myrtle Beach. I played golf for a week with my buddy Dick, with my friend Dick. And it was probably, you know, Dick's probably 15, 20 years older than I am. So almost as old as my dad, uh, but, but he was one of my mentors in the faith. And so we would go, we would have a road trip and he would, we would laugh and he would tell jokes and stories and we'd eat good food and play golf and just hung out for that time. And Dick was the kind of guy that we're walking down one night after dinner, we're walking down near the shore, like, I guess the, down near the shoreline down there at Myrtle Beach somewhere one, eve, one nice evening. And he just said, let's stop. He said, I, I have, I'm just, I really sense right now the, Lord, the Holy Spirit wants me to pray for you and pray blessing over your life right now. And so he just stopped, put his hand on me and prayed over me. And that was the time in my life when I was actually contemplating the call to ministry. I was praying about what to do and was God calling me to be a pastor and pursue you know, seminary and all that. So God was just using Dick to pray things into my life that I needed to be established and he was sensitive enough to the Spirit to pray for it. And I still, like, just remember that powerful time. And that was just one moment of many when he would just stop, let's pray, let's pray. And so he was just very in tune to the things of, of the Lord and the voice of the Lord and prayed for me. So that's a, an example of someone in my life. You have someone in your life. I pray you do. If you don't, God help me to 
to find that one. I'm sure many of you have that person, maybe several of those people already in your life. But I want to encourage you this week. In fact, I have a note here, an application. A lot of times we hear a message and it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But an application, and I have this down here. This week, for your Thanksgiving, because you've got some, hopefully some time off this week, some extra time, write someone who has been instrumental in your growth in Christ, write them a card or a note this week or a letter and send it to them or give it to them or whatever you got to do. But make that part of your Thanksgiving. I'm going to do that this week for myself. I have a, a name that I want to, I want to jot a card or a note and get it out in the mail. And the, I'm doing snail. I'm talking snail mail here. I, you can text somebody. I, I love texting. But this is extra, extra level, extra measure. You know, pen. Remember those things? Pen and paper or type, you know, type it, whatever. But, but think about that. Let God speak to your heart about that this week. Who, who, who needs to hear from you? Thank you. Thank you for investing in my life. Thank you for pouring into me. Thank you for encouraging me. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for praying for me. Thank you for spurring me on. There, there's, I know all of you have somebody who you could connect with or send a letter to this week and, and make that known. So that's the first part of thankful for the people God has placed in our life. The second part of this, though, is, is about the people who have who you have labored alongside in the work of the gospel. And he uses the word there, and I think it's verse 5, the word partnership. I'm thankful for your partnership. The actual Greek word there is the word koinonia. And many of you have heard that word before, and it's the word we often translate fellowship. Fellowship. So, but, but koinonia has an even deeper meaning. It's not just sharing something in common, but participating in something together. There's another layer to koinonia. And so for Paul, it was, you have participated with me in advancing the gospel in this place, in Philippi. God has used you. In fact, if, I was just reminded, I was talking to Don Allcape earlier this morning, Paul actually never got to, physically got to Philippi. He, he, he got to, he, well, actually, that's not true. He ended up there in Acts chapter 16. I'll talk about that in a minute. But in terms of his, one of his as he made his missionary journeys around, he, he, he thought about the people who God used to help further that mission. It's ironic. It's, I don't know why I said that. It's ironic because Paul was so thankful for the people in Philippi. Because actually, Philippi was tough sledding for Paul. If you go back to Acts chapter 16, and he, he, it started well in Philippi. He started with a meeting, with some, a prayer meeting with some women. And there was a woman there named Lydia. And they were meeting down by the river uh, water area. And he, Paul, that's where he ended up. God, the Spirit led him to that place. And he's down there with Lydia, the seller of purple. And he shares the gospel with them. And Lydia receives it. But then it takes a turn for the worse. And he ends up, meeting a demon-possessed slave girl who started to disrupt their preaching. They were going around teaching about Jesus. This girl would follow them, and she would spout out, these, listen to these people, and she was being disruptive. The son of the most high God, and she was just spouting out words, 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 and it was becoming problematic. And so Paul casts out the spirit, casts out the demon, and the owners of that slave girl, they were not happy because they stood to lose a lot of money. So they took Paul and Silas before the local authorities and they ordered them to be stripped and beaten and thrown into the prison and put in stocks and pain and suffering is what waited them. And as they began worshiping and singing, you remember the story, Paul and Silas, it's midnight and they're in prison and they're bleeding and they're in pain and they're in the stockades, but they're singing and praying and worshiping God in that prison. And if you do read the story or remember the story, there's an earthquake that takes place and all the prison gates, the prison doors open, the bars swing open and the shackles of the prisoners fall off in the midst of the earthquake and they are primed for a jailbreak. It looks like a perfect opportunity to get away. But, but the Spirit of the Lord had something in mind for that jailer. God had a plan for that jailer and his family. And so Paul, in, in that moment, he make sure all the prisoners stay put. And he assures the guard, hey, we're all here. 
we're all, he's going to kill himself because if they escape, he's going to lose his life. So he's about ready to plunge himself through. And Paul says, no, 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 we're all here. And the, he is so overwhelmed by what has happened. He gets down on his knees and says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and all your household. And he gives his life to Christ right there. And in fact, they go back to, the, and he, they're, they're baptized. He, he and his fa family are baptized that very evening. So God had a, an amazing plan in Philippi. It's, it, it, it went through a lot of heartache for Paul, bleeding and beatings and prison. And, it, and, but God had a way. Lives were changed forever. And Paul never forgot it. You know, there's a work of grace in Paul's life here and also in our life that when you look back on something that may have been hard and painful and the Holy Spirit helps you remember the good things through the maze of pain, that's a grace from God. And I know some of you have that experience where you can look back on a situation that was very difficult in your life, but part of God's grace is, yeah, there were some tough things that happened, but, I, what, but what I see and what I recall are the amazing things that God did, the really good things that God, the eternal things that God did, shaping my life, shaping their life, helping us, whatever, providing, rescuing, delivering. And so there's a grace from God in that, in that way. Paul's joy and thankfulness were directly proportional to the growth of the family business. I started that out talking about the family business when the gospel was spread, Paul rejoiced. When the gospel advanced, Paul was thankful. When the gospel went forward, Paul was elated because that was what God called him to do. And so when it happened, even through pain and even through beating and prison, he was rejoicing and thankful for what God had done and the people. I love what Brian Wilkerson said. He said, Lydia, the slave girl, the jailer and his family, these people's lives have been changed for eternity. But Paul's life had been changed too. They had made a mark on him. Together they had done something great for God. They not only planted the church in Philippi, they established a beachhead for the gospel, uh, for the gospel and the, and, the, and the continent of Europe. And it would, it would all spring from there. Paul and the Philippians weren't just friends, they were partners. They were friends in ministry, and they never forgot each other. Because when you go through the fire together, there's something that just <laughs> unites your hearts in that. When you're standing on the back of a pickup truck trying to get food out while the raging dogs are yapping and going to bite your head off, you kind of remember who you're with and what happened in that moment when you're fighting the battle together, when you're on the line together. And so the question I have for you this morning, do you have friends that have served alongside of you in the work of Christ. People who you have gone to battle with, who you have sacrificed with in order to do something for God. Do you have people like that in your life? And maybe it was a mission trip that you were a part of. Or maybe it was a vacation Bible school group. I love when we get our VBS team together. we got a great team about 80, 90, 100 volunteers that slam in here for a week in the summer, and it is all tilt, full gone, let's go. And it's a little crazy, but it's also amazing when you do it together. And you're, you're, you're sharing the, the hope of Christ with all these children, and you, and you just sense in the air, there's something that's binding us together right now. This is not about us. There's something greater happening here, and we get to be a part of it. All of us, violent, we, get to, we get to share in, the, in what God is doing across these kids' lives. It's an amazing thing. Bible school, Awana, if you're on the youth ministry team, if you do serve now, when you step out to serve and you step out to, to share the gospel and to partner with others in what God is doing, there's something about that that draws hearts together. And, and, and in my case, I know I'm grateful, grateful, grateful for the people that God surrounds me with in that effort. And so you're a part of it, and I'm a part of it. And we want to be grateful for one another in that way. So think about that. The people that have, have blessed you and influenced you in your growth, but also the people that you have labored alongside, the people that you have stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with on the line to advance the gospel. Second thing we're going to talk about this morning 
is to be thankful for God's work in your life. So it's the people, but it's also God's work. Because Paul says in verse 6, he says, I am confident of this. He who began a good work in you, God began a good work in you. And Paul says, and he will be faithful to complete it. In fact, some of your versions say, may say, he will be faithful, he will perfect it. He will, he will bring it to its full conclusion. Because he is a finisher. I'll say more about that in a minute. But he is, a, he is, he is and he will be working all the way until the day of Christ Jesus. So when, the, when Jesus comes back, when he cracks the clouds and the, comes through, down through the, the clouds, when he comes again, as he promised to do, until that day or until God calls you home to be in his presence. Either way, he's going to finish what he set out to do. Last week, Pastor Chuck talked about us being thankful that God has redeemed us. And that was the beginning of his work. In fact, um, God's first good work, you know what God's first good work is in our lives? His first good work is to help us see our guilt, our need for him. That's his first good work. To, the, the Bible says the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. That the first thing we knew it, it needed to have our hearts pierced to recognize how desperately we need God, how desperately we need a Savior. The very first good work. And the word here in this text for begin, God who, he who began a good work in you, the word began is actually a Greek word that means to inaugurate. Does that sound familiar? When we have in this nation, there is every four years or every eight years, depending, there is what we call an inauguration. It's a really big event that happens in Washington, D.C. There's speeches made. There's an official ceremony. There's a Bible brought out. There's a hand put on the Bible. There's an oath of office taken. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a solemn thing. I know politically we all, you know, you, you, we get a little bit, oh, come on. But think about the concept of when we talk about an inauguration, we talk about a new beginning, that something fresh is happening. There's a new person in the Oval Office. And so here comes a new administration, right? So some, inauguration is something that is planned and executed to perfection and when God does it. And so the key for us this morning is this is God's work. And so in Lydia's case, in fact, if you have your Bible, just flip back to Acts chapter 16. And I just want you to see that for a second. 16th chapter of Acts, and this is the account when Paul does end up in Philippi. And I'll start verse 13. On the Sabbath, Paul says, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. And we sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. And one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple from the city of Theatira, who was a worshiper of God. And what to say, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. She said, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay in my house. And she persuaded us. So the, the church was planted in Philippi in Lydia's house. She's the first convert in that place. And she opened up her home so that the church could meet there and gather there. And what I love about that is Luke talks. So Paul, Paul preaches the message, and it's probably a similar message to what he preached to the jailer. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, right? B believe and you will be saved. Lydia had that moment, that beginning, when she and the other woman heard the message. Although, did you notice how Luke captured it in verse 14? He says, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Paul is the vessel. Paul is speaking, but God is working. It's God's work. Same thing that happens here. When me or Pastor Chuck or Dustin or anybody that gets up here to preach God's word, we're doing what God's called us to do, but it's God who's speaking. It's God's spirit who's moving. I can't touch your heart. I'm not that good. I can speak God's truth, and then God has to put it on your heart 
God has to make, apply it to your heart. God has to weld it to your heart. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And that's what's happening here. Paul's sharing the message and the Holy Spirit's working and he convinces Lydia, you need, you need, you need. And Lydia opens up her heart. God inaugurated something in Lydia's heart. And the Spirit of God has done the same thing in your heart. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God has inaugurated something in you. He has begun something in you. The challenge is, it's not done when you get saved. I'll use the word, that word, when you get saved. It's actually just the beginning. And it's a, it's a gradual, lifelong work of making you and I holy, making us more like him. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2.10, we are his workmanship. We are his, what's the word? In the, it's the, we are his poema. We are God's poem. We are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Now, we can tend to get impatient. We look at our lives, and sometimes we look at ourselves, <clears throat> and we look at our circumstances, and we can be left to wonder. And we can wonder, is God working? Is this really God's work? Because we look at ourselves, we go, you know what? I know my heart. And I know what I'm experiencing, and I know what I'm going through, and I'm wondering, is this, is this God? And so we, sometimes we have doubts about that. We wonder, based on the season of life that we're in, is God really behind this thing? Am I really in his hands? Is this really happening? We can wonder about that. It's like coming into an artist's studio and find the artist in the middle of creating his masterpiece. So you walk into a studio, and there's an artist there, and if, when you walk in, it might be the time when he has just taken the paint and kind of splashed some on the canvas, and he's getting ready to move it around and make it into something beautiful. But when you see it, it's kind of like, oh, it's just splotches of paint. Is this really like the thing? And sometimes you feel like that in your life. Like, it just seems like splotches of paint. But God's working, and he's creating He's painting, and he's orchestrating, and he's sovereignly guiding the process, and he is making, the Bible says, he, is com he will complete the masterpiece. You are his master, and he's going to complete the work. He's going to finish it. He's going to perfect it. He's going he's to bring it to conclusion, mm. which leads us to the deeply encouraging truth about God. He is a finisher. How many of you have unfinished projects in your life. Uh-huh. I won't ask for hands because I'll just about, I think all of them are going to go up. Like a lot of you are going to put your hands up. Like I've got like at least five or six things on my to-do list. Some of those things can even go back a couple years now. Shame on you, right? But if, you've, if you're like, well, I know I'm not like Mr. Handyman, but I guarantee even some of the handy guys you're so good, you got, you're doing stuff for other people, so you got stuff at your house that needs to be done too, right? So that's how it works. But there are, there are, always, there are always unfinished things in our lives. Our home project list, our, our, our whatever stuff we got going on in our house. I'm so glad God isn't like us. He doesn't leave anything unfinished. Hmm. Let that sink in. God is building his character in your life. He is transforming you from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. In fact, for in all things, God is putting the finishing touches on your life. Through good news, through bad news, through difficulty, through blessing, through unexpected happiness, through unexpected trouble, it all has a purpose. And he's painting and working and moving and creating through all of it. He's finishing, completing the work that he began in you. And I finish this with that phrase in verse 7. He says that uh, all of you share in God's grace with me. In fact, I want to read the entirety of the verse there, verse 7. It said, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, tenderness, affection, for whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. 
And God's grace, as we finish this morning, is multidimensional. And so there are several layers of God's grace. I just want to mention three. There's a lot more than that, but there's three big ones I want to mention to you. There is, there is the work of saving grace, which is what we often think of. I'm saved by grace through faith. I'm saved by the work of the cross. Uh, it's, it's the work of the cross in my life. Is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I am born again of the Spirit. How? By the work of the Spirit. It's God's grace in my life. I'm saved I'm adopted because of God's saving grace. Praise God. That's where it starts. But there's also something called sustaining grace, which is where we get day-by-day strength, day-by-day wisdom to navigate our lives, peace that we need every single day we walk out the door. God, give me a sense of your peace this morning. I I want to walk in your peace today as I move through life. I need your hope. And so that's sustaining grace We are, in fact, there's a phrase that says, we are kept by him. We are kept by God's sustaining grace. Your life is is only possible, only, you can only get out of bed in the morning if God gives you the grace to get out of bed in the morning. And some of you have had to stay in bed through an illness or a thing, you've been set back or you've been in the hospital. You know how much you depend on God's sustaining grace to make it every single day. It's not just physically, a lot of other ways as well. And then the the final dimension of that is enabling grace, which is the grace to do what he has called us to do, to serve others, to share the gospel, to make sacrifices, what the Bible says, to take up your cross. How do you take up your cross? God's grace. I want to take up my cross. I can't take up my cross unless God's given me the grace to carry it because it's hard and it's heavy and it's an obedient walk and I need God's grace to do it. And so there's something about that. The grace to extend the kingdom of God, whether that's preaching or praying or giving or leading or helping, I need God's grace to enable to enable me. I need God's grace to save me. I need God's grace to sustain me. I need God's grace to enable me. So when Paul talks about you, have, you are sharing in this grace with me, there's a lot to that. In fact, there's more, but that's enough for now. If you get a handle on those three, you're getting a pretty good handle. Thank you for listening to our latest sermon. We look forward to having you join us next week as we begin our Advent series. In the meantime, connect with us online. Visit our website at www.provchurch.net or check out our Facebook at Prov Church Life. Until next time.